some people have something called a hybrid claim, which I'll explain, and some people have a lower arousal threshold. <clears throat> so the lower arousal threshold means that your brain is kind of too sensitive to a narrow airway. So when we all go to sleep, you go through in the first perhaps five breaths this transition to the sleep phase. In that five breaths or so, your throat becomes pretty unstable and your airflow reduces and you're sort of starting to suffocate a little bit. But usually in the non-apneic, you, you, you settle into a nice stable uh, breathing pattern with good muscle tone. Now some people, um, their brain is far too sensitive to that uh, brief period of, uh, of instability in the pharynx and they'll arouse and they'll go up to very light level of sleep or almost wake up. So they spend the whole night cycling in these very light levels of sleep and um, this can make them feel like they sound exhausted in the morning um, and uh, some of those patients uh, uh, respond in fact rather paradoxically to uh, some of these sedatives. Now normally you don't want to get a sleep apneic sedative. <coughs> Everybody knows that if they sleep a bit and they have a few too many wines, I'll snort a lot more, right? It's, um, it's a pretty common uh, story. And also, <coughs> alcohol is like any other sedative, it just makes your muscles more relaxed and so you snore more or have worse apnea. But these people respond to this <coughs> Then you get people with this thing called a high loop gain. This is a weird problem. When you're going through this little transition into sleep, as I talked about, you get a bit of a rise in carbon dioxide level. And um, normally your brain can sort of tolerate for that and you ventilate a little bit more and then you blow off the carbon dioxide. People that have a high loop gain, they overbreathe and they just go crazy, they breathe too much, their carbon dioxide level drops, then they have uh, an apnea. And, uh, and they keep doing that all night, and that, that causes them to be tired. So some of those patients uh, benefit from a, from a type of a diuretic which can, which can um, uh, overcome that problem. But for most people, this is an, an, an acting problem. Um, most of our patients with sleep apnea have an anatomical predisposition to it, at least as part of the cause of their sleep apnea. And the common ones we all see are the tonsils, uh, this can occur in adults, but also children, of course, or most of the kids that have sleep apnea have big tonsils and animals. <coughs> many, I'm sure many of you uh, see patients like this and talk to them about orthognathic surgery. Um, Retronathia, of course, understandably, forces the whole tongue uh, posteriorly and narrows the airway. We see uh, 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 constricted or narrow uh, uh, upper jaws. Um, it's really uh, Nothing makes me happier when I'm consulting and I, I see someone come in for could be a completely unrelated reason, but they have an expander uh, plate on their upper jaw, it could be a teenager. And it's just fantastic when I see um, your profession being really proactive about correcting these, um, these uh, impending bite abnormalities and jaw abnormalities at a young age when, when you can do it without um, you know, kind of really invasive surgery. Um, but unfortunately, some adults like this may need uh, corticotomy and expansion. <coughs> uh, lingual tonsil hypertrophy is another one we see sometimes. This is an endoscopic view. There's the epiglottis there. These are massive lingual tonsils which are taking up you know, centimetres of food in the throat, and getting rid of that can really improve sleep so apnea. Um, but unfortunately, in our society, is, uh, is this problem. Um, and um, there are a number of reasons why this, this can uh, contribute to sleep apnea. Firstly, the tongue, uh, the tongue is a unique muscle. I mean, you think of muscle as, as being pretty lean, and most muscle is, but your tongue is almost like your own sort of wagyu in your mouth. It's the highest fat content muscle of any body in the human body. Uh, any muscle in the human body weird because it's always moving, but the posterior and the inferior part of the tongue in particular has a pretty high fat content. And so as people put on weight as their PMI goes up, the tongue volume does increase, um, as does the uh, soft tissue uh, thickness of the palate, electropharyngeal wall. All of this conspires to make the airway smaller. Um, there are some, probably some other sort of physiological or human effects of increasing weight on, on breathing as well. <clears throat> so, um, when we were investigating sleep apnea patients, um, obviously we depend on history, the examination, we look in their throat with an endoscope, with an endoscope. Um, sometimes we use radiology. Um, if someone looks uh, particularly uh, recessive in the maxilla or the mandible, I'll sometimes get a, um, a CT cephalogram or, or a or that. And then um, sometimes we use this 
uh, technique, bone induced endoscopy. Um, <clears throat> this is very popular in um, in Europe. Um, sorry, I'm just um, get the mouse going here. This is very popular in, in Europe, um, and uh, we use it in our research uh, protocol, which I'll, I'll show you some videos of. But essentially, it's intravenous propofol, uh, as you know, commonly used in anesthesia. Uh, and you sedate people down to the point where they're snoring. Um, they're, you don't intubate them, they're breathing on their own. And this is the sort of thing you see. Uh, this is a, a sort of apnea. You can see, in this case, a circumferential obstruction of the retropalpal airway. And you can see the tongue epi down down the distance, prolapsing backwards. Um, when you, we, we do this uh, with, a, with a, an infusion under pretty, pretty good control. Um, and you see patients have apneas, they'll often desaturate, you know, them a bit of a jaw lift to rescue them from the apnea. Um, so I think it appeals to our, the way our simple uh, brain works. We love to see stuff, right? Seeing is believing. My problem with this technique is that, is that uh, propofol is a drug. It's the drug that Michael Jackson used, and we all know what happened here, um, to go to sleep. And, and so it's not natural sleep, and it does do things to muscle tone, which you don't see in natural sleep. So I always interpret it with a bit of a grain of salt. Um, let's go to that. Now, um, <clears throat> we always try to work out where the obstructions occur in sleep at. You know, is it the tonsils, is it the palate, is it the tongue base, is it the whole lot? Um, to, to help direct our treatment and know where to go and uh, if there are candidates for surgery. Um, there are some studies, in, there are only a couple of them in the literature of, of sleep, natural sleep in an MRI scanner. Now, I'm guessing some of you have had, had an MRI scan. Um, I love MRI scans. I could have one every day if I could because no one can phone you in an MRI scan. <laughs> <laughs> and until uh, that brings out a medical free phone, I suppose. But, um, but they're great because because but they are noisy, that's the point I was going to make. So um, there are a number of studies with people under sedation sleeping in a uh, um, MRI scan, and that's what the problem is with the drug induced sleep. But there are two or three studies showing natural sleep. Uh, they usually take people awake for 24 hours, so they're exhausted, and then put them in the MRI scanner and scan them. And the interesting thing is that, excuse <coughs> me, you see um, the pharynx behaving differently at different times of sleep. So, for example, in, in, in this um, group of 15 patients, 7 of 15, they collapsed their whole airway, behind the tongue and the palate. But 5 of the 15 um, didn't obstruct <coughs> behind the tongue, they just obstructed behind their palate. And then 3 of the 15 obstructed uh, partly behind their palate and partly behind, it, behind the whole lot. So, the, 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 the take home message from that is that at different times of the night, you, your, th your throat probably does different things, so what you see in a five minute snapshot may not be representative the whole night. So, getting on to the treatment for sleep apnea, um, we kind of in this era now of personalised medicine, we try to tailor everything to suit the uh, patient, and because it's a heterogeneous problem, there are many different treatments. Um, so, we'll just sort of brush over them. Firstly, um, there are uh, anatomical therapies. You're very familiar, um, many of you, with mandibular advancement splints. Um, these are uh, really effective in something like 75% of patients, I think, in, with mild to moderate sleep apnea. Um, the better you select patients for the therapy for this, the, the better the results are. So particularly those people with recessive mandibles uh, and overjets and so on, um, they'll often do really well with a mandibular advancement splint. CPAP, we're all familiar with. Um, it's, the, it's guaranteed to work 100%. <coughs> the problem is um, CPAP is compliance. Uh, if you read ResMed or any other manufacturer's literature, they'll probably have smiling, happy faces and 80% or something um, satisfaction rates. But real world literature would suggest that it's probably more like 50%, if that. Um, positional therapy is really useful. If you get a sleep study back and a patient shows they have only sleep apnea when they're on their back and not on their side, there are now some devices that you can wear which will vibrate when the patient rolls on their back and they're all on their side. It's called positional therapy. They're very effective. Or, or just cinch half a tennis ball into the back of the shirt and time on it. Uh, um, there's a few little um, cute kind of series about throat and tongue exercises which can help a bit. Um, there's um, 
treatments for those physiological things I talked about, boot gain arousal thresholds, they're a very small minority. We encourage people to lose weight, of course. Um, and then there's surgery. Now, there's a whole lot of different operations which I'll sort of uh, run through briefly. Uh, and then the most recent thing is uh, electricity, so simulating the hypothalamus nerve. <coughs> so the sort of commonest operation that's done this morning, sleep apnea is called a UPP, the uvular plate of finger capacity. First done in 1979 in Detroit, um, but uh, that's in the industry as well. First done in 1952 in Japan. Um, and it used to be a pretty horrible operation with tap tonsils out there, and they used to cut a big arch of pallet off. And you've probably seen some patients that had this done in the 80s or 90s with a big arch off there, and it looks terrible and it felt terrible. The result would be good for about a year, and then the scar contracture would pull the pallet back and you'd end up in the same boat. Sometimes really aggressive surgeons would cut too much pallet off, and people would have blatant incompetence, like cleft pallet speech forever, which was a disaster. So over the years, uh, more recently, in the last uh, one or two decades, we've changed the way this operation is done. And it's much more of a reconstructive procedure now where we just reposition the pallet anteriorly by doing a sort of a Z plasty out here and, and pulling the pallet forward. So whilst a 2D picture doesn't do this uh, justice, the pallet's brought a long way forward away from the posterior wall. And it's a much more effective procedure. <coughs> There's a, another operation which um, developed by a friend of mine in Wisconsin uh, uh, who um, described this operation called a transpalpable advancement. It's set effectively, it's a sort of a poor man's upper jaw advancement. Uh, by that I mean you just take about a centimetre of bone out of the back of the hard palate and pull the soft palate forward. It's usually done in combination with a UP3 operation. Uh, we don't mention to do these very often, and they're only done in people that have a very vertical soft palate that sits very close to the posterior wall. But it is a pretty effective operation at stabilising the retropalpable airway. Um, we can do a number of things down to the tongue base level. Sometimes you see people with these posterior leaning epiglottis sort of uh, configurations. Here's the um, tongue base here, epiglottis overhanging the larynx. <coughs> Um, and to treat those, I dissolve away some of the lingual tonsil. Um, I denude the anterior surface of the device and get it to scar forwards, and that's the post operative picture. <coughs> so it really opens up the um, airway there nicely. Um, then you have patients who have a lovely, spacious retropalpable airway with a very narrow retro retrolingual airway, and they may not get a benefit from a mandibular advancement splint. Um, if their tongue is quite bulky like this lady's was, and the airway there very narrow, then um, you can debulk the tongue muscle. Um, so this is a, there are a whole lot of operations described to do that, but this is a sort of an endoscopic approach, um, which I will just speed through a little bit, um, where an incision is made in the mucosa, um, uh, flaps are lifted, as you'll see, because of that, and then we use an, um, an instrument called a code later, which is a radio frequency device with irrigation and suction in it, and just debulk the tongue muscle, really. It's sort of like um, painting, really. It just dissolves the muscle away uh, very effectively and controls the bleeding, and you can keep doing that also right up here because it's pretty boring. But you, um, you really can debulk the tongue muscle a lot. It's, it's pretty forgiving, really. Um, <laughs> And, it's, and now as you see at the end, you can see her epiglottis again, whereas you couldn't see her epiglottis beforehand. This lady actually, um, her sick apnea was just normally borderline mild to moderate, so it wasn't too bad, but she was absolutely exhausted with it and could only work half a day and would have to go home and sleep. And she was like, she was a very thin lady, so good candidate to surgery, but you can see it really exploded her epiglottis motion and her tiredness resolved. There are much more aggressive things you can do to reduce the, the bulk of the tongue muscle. Um, there's a, a nice bloke in uh, Paris who I bet he's a maxillofacial surgeon and trained as an ENT surgeon, Frederick Chabol, and he described, he, he did a lot of head neck surgery for cancer, like, as I do, and he described a trans cervical approach through the tongue base to take out a wedge of tissue. Uh, I did two of these and vowed to never do it again. It was, mis it was miserable for me as it was for the patient, I think. I need a tracheostomy and so on. This is the sort of thing that hypoglossal nerve stimulation will confine to the history books. 
Uh, other things that have been used over the years, until recently, to open up the airway behind the tongue, advancing the hyoid bone over the front of the thyroid cartilage and suturing it, and um, um, that's called a hyoid advancement. Pretty straightforward to do. Sometimes it causes swallowing problems. And then this thing called a genotubical advancement, which I haven't done for about, I reckon, 12, 14 years. Uh, but it's a, you cut a core of bone out of the uh, mandible there, capturing the genie glossus as it att attaches to the uh, superior genial tubercle, pulling it forward, rotating it, taking off the outer cortex and then fixing the inner cortex with a screw, throw it out of focus and closing it up. So you sort of advance the genie glossus. It's actually not, it's very unpredictable as to how effective it is, so I've stopped doing that as many people have. And finally, this is the sort of uh, king hit, if you like, for sleep apnea. Maximum mandibular advancement. Um, it's a really uh, good operation. Um, but talking a 50-year-old man or woman into having this done is pretty hard. Um, 20 odd year olds, if you'll see that have automatic problems, are much more likely to undergo this sort of surgery uh, for bicep analogies. But you know, people in the later age groups really don't want to do it. But it is a pretty effective operation for sort of apnea. Um, so, um, given that a lot of these operations, particularly down at the tongue base level, which is often involved in particularly moderate diseases, but you think a lot of them are not that effective, people are looking for better ways to control sleep apnea. And when you think about it, when you lie a sleep apnea down, have a look at their airways, they don't snore and they don't disrupt. They're, they're their airways are perfectly good when they're awake. So, their airways good when they're awake. So it's, it's something about the sleep state that affects the airway, and it's mainly the muscle relaxation. Um, so logically, you would think that if you could recreate some sort of a wet state in some of the muscles in the throat, you might be able to help their sleep apnea. And um, Alan Schwartz, who's a sleep physician in um, Baltimore, Maryland, um, uh, who uh, he does a lot of research on sleep apnea, and he uh, developed a CAT model um, of hypoglossal nerve stimulation. Um, and found it to be very effective. Um, so um, the, the genial osseous muscle, which is the main muscle in the tongue, as you know, um, attaches to the genial tubercle. And it has a, a horizontal part, the part and an oblique part, and it fans out uh, all throughout the tongue. And then there are the intrinsic muscles, which are mainly in this sort of um, superficial bit of the tongue. Uh, there's a genial, genial hyoid. Um, and then there's the extrinsic muscle of the tongue, the hyoglossus, sideglossus, and so on. But when you stimulate the hyoglossal nerve, depending on where you stimulate it, you can really uh, stimulate the muscles that protrude the tongue. And that's what we're trying to do in hyoglossal nerve stimulation. And I'll show you in a minute how to do that. Um, there's all these different branches of the hyoglossal nerve, which do different things to different muscles. Uh, here's a schematic of the hypoglossal nerve, the 12 panel nerve, as you know. As it comes more and more anteriorly, <coughs> it tends to uh, stimulate just the pr tongue uh, protruders. If you stimulate the hypoglossal nerve back here, you'll also stimulate tongue retractors. You don't want to do that. So we have to be careful about where we stimulate the hypoglossal nerve. Um, now, on the basis of um, Alan Schwartz's research, there, are th there have been three systems developed. I'll put this one in brackets because that uh, were, came off the market or never made it to the market actually. There's Inspire, Enthera and uh, Nixol, which is the device that I'll talk about in a bit more detail. Um, so the Inspire device um, is, uh, has been in use in America and Europe for about over six years now. Um, it's a single-sided stimulator. It's on one hypoglossal nerve here. It, a wire is, uh, it's got a cuff electrode you put around the nerve. You tunnel the wire down to this pacemaking unit, which sits just like a cardiac pacemaker on the chest. <coughs> and then another little wire goes to the ribs, to the, to the intercostal muscles. So the way it works is when you breathe, <coughs> your muscles of respiration are active. It senses that. And then the little computer in here and the battery say, ah, he's breathing in, let's send a signal up to the hypoglossal nerve and stimulate it. And then that protrudes the tongue. So it's synchronized with respiration. Um, and um, it works pretty well, actually. The, the big pilot study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is 
pretty impressive getting any publication in that. And um, they had 126 people from multiple centres in America and Europe. Um, they had sleep apnea that was uh, between 20 and 50 events per hour. The upper limit of BMI was 32, so they went too big, and they had small tonsils. They um, excluded patients that on sleep endoscopy had that circumferential structure behind the palate. Uh, and uh, they implanted them and then they uh, uh, studied them uh, after the implant and activated the implant. They did PSG means sleep study, close on the ground, at 2, 6, and 12 months. Um, just some pictures of putting the thing in. There's the electrode on the nerve. Uh, it's stabilised here and then the wire goes down to the pacemaker. Uh, they looked at their outcome measures for the gap and alpha units and the amount of oxygen desaturation. Um, I won't go over all this other stuff, but quality of life scores were collected as well, which are probably just as, if not more important. And then they did a pretty smart thing. The first 46 responders, they randomised into keeping their trip going or withdrawing it to see what happened. And then they followed them up. Um, I'll just show you in the pictures here what they found. <coughs> so here's the, um, here's the two groups. Uh, this is the therapy maintenance group here. This is the withdrawal group. So they're all pretty bad sleep apnea to, at the baseline. Here they are at 12 months. So pretty good control of the sleep apnea. This is the um, uh, apnea hypoxia index per hour. So you know, 30 per hour is on the borderline of severe and moderate sleep apnea. And they went down a very mild sleep apnea with their therapy on. Then this group, they carried the therapy on. This group, they withdrew it. Guess what? They got worse. So it wasn't just pure luck that their sleep apnea improved. Um, their oxygen desaturation also improved a lot. They stopped oxygen desaturating. So they showed pretty conclusively that stimulating one hypoglossal nerve was effective. Just some pictures from uh, Yoki Mora, who's a, a friend in uh, uh, Mannheim. Um, with the therapy off, this is the tongue base, uh, sorry, the palate with therapy off, therapy on, tongue base, therapy off, therapy on. So it opens the airway. And as they stimulated them more, they got more opening. Um, now, this device is uh, still in trial. This is called Inthera. It's a cuff electrode, and around the, in the electrode, they've got lots of little small electrodes. They wrap it around the nerve and then they selectively stimulate the nerve from different sides and work out which side of the nerve gives the best protrusion. Um, I have my doubts as to whether this will be very effective, but it's still in the testing phase. Um, now the problem with the Inspire device is they come through an incision in the neck, like you take out a submandibular gland, that sort of incision. The trouble with that is, coming in from here, um, as you can see, the hypoglossal nerve runs forward on the right side here, across the hypoglossus muscle, and then it starts branching. It's branching all along its length, actually, but any branches here will stimulate the hypoglossus muscle. Now, the hypoglossus muscle will pull your tongue backwards. You don't want to do that. So I think that they struggle through that incision to get far enough forward to exclude any retracted branches. The Nixella device, which I'll talk about in a sec, um, we implant it way up here as the hypoglossal nerve is going into the geniglossus muscle. Um, and looking at it this way, hypoglossal nerve coming through here, we put our electrode right up here so we're much more likely to only get tongue protruders. Um, just another diagram of the hypoglossal nerve. You really don't want to stimulate it here, you want to stimulate it way up here. Um, <coughs> so that's the first part of the talk, and I'll come now on to the Excel device, which is in the uh, second talk. Um, are there any questions for the first part? Um, has been uh, in development for quite a long time actually 
Um, it's a bit like medications, you know, when a new drug comes to market, it's usually a billion dollars later or something in, in years of research. It's a little bit the same with this. Uh, it was first conceived by, um, in Israel, in fact, by a, uh, a two brothers. One of them is a, uh, a trained in gynecology, but I think uh, was um, uh, never really interested in clinical medicine. He's more of an entrepreneur and inventor, and he's got a few devices that he's invented, and his brother is an electrical engineer. Um, so they um, developed this device which actually only stimulated one nerve at a time. Subsequently, um, it was the idea was bought by a fellow in um, Belgium who has three pharmaceutical companies. His name is Rob Tor, really lovely man, 72 years of age, who uh, uh, is sort of a bit of a polymath, really. Um, never studied science. He, he studied languages in Antwerp, uh, but he's a terrific reader and a very intelligent fellow, and uh, he thought it was a good idea. So he put, and he put about, I think, 70 million US of his own money into it. Um, and then some of his mates who are investors in Europe have put a whole lot more in. And more recently, Cochlear Corporation, the Australian uh, and now international company, and ResMed have put vast amounts of um, euros into this device. And so it's really stepped up now into, uh, into a different level and uh, will hopefully be available on the open market in Australia uh, in the second half of this year. So what it is, is it's a, uh, a bilateral stimulator. These two things here are um, are electrodes, they're bipolar electrodes, they're positive and a negative, uh, connected to a, an antenna, and there's a little circuit board there. Um, and um, this is inserted uh, surgically deep in the neck, under the chin, it's a six centimeter incision under the chin, um, and the device is implanted there on the very distal part of the hypothalamus nerve, just as it's entering the genie loss muscle. <coughs> now, it's a passive device, it does not have a battery in it, so it's not it's useless, it doesn't do anything. Very much like a copper implant, which you've probably seen people wearing, uh, you need to send it some power. To do that, uh, a patch is placed on the skin, here's the patch, clipped onto which is a little battery and microprocessor. And that sends the power through the skin and soft tissue to the implant. <coughs> so <coughs> the patch puts up that on at night when they go to sleep and then activates the device and away it goes. They take the patch off in the morning, remove the little battery and processor, and place it into this nice little recharging unit, and they make it compatible with, you know, iPhones or Samsungs or Huawei's or whatever you've got. Uh, and it charges while you're at work. Now, um, the concept of bilateral stimulation um, uh, was first developed uh, on a pig model. And um, they found, in fact, that on a pig model, the airway opening was better if they stimulated uh, two nerves rather than one. And this is some little fluoroscopic videos of a pig. On the left is the unilateral stimulation, and on the right is the bilateral stimulation. And you'll have to take my word for it, but the contraction of the tongue on this side uh, is actually greater, and they measured the airway opening and showed it to be significantly better um, uh, with bilateral stimulation. So this shows zero <coughs> up to 100% stimulation amplitude uh, on the pigs. This is stimulating one nerve, this is stimulating both nerves. And up here is airway opening in millimeters. So you can see, say, for 20% stimulation, you've got a lot more airway opening with stimulating two nerves rather than one. So they, they were pretty um, uh, optimistic about, uh, about uh, the concept of bilateral stimulation. <clears throat> um, the implantation of this device, well first the indications, you've got to have moderate to severe sleep apnea and you have to be uh, refractory or failed or refused devices such as CPAP, mandibular advancement splints, thought to not be uh, appropriate for conventional surgery. Now if someone had whopping big tonsils, I wouldn't tell them I was going to put this in and take out the big tonsils and maybe do some of their part first. But, um, we insert this under a general anaesthetic. It takes about two hours to put it in. Uh, it's done as a day case or a one night stay in hospital. Uh, a few of my patients from the two trials that we've done uh, have gone back to work the next day. So just gives you a bit of context as to the uh, magnitude of the operation. It's nothing like doing throat surgery, which is really painful and one to two weeks off work. So the downtime is minimal. Um, 
we insert, um, when we're implanting these things, we monitor uh, the nerve. So we use um, electrodes in the genioglossus muscle and also in the hyoglossus muscle. Um, and um, uh, here's a picture of the, uh, the uh, nerve integrity monitor we use. So I put electrodes in through the floor of the mouth into the genioglossus. And I also put some electrodes in sterile and screw the neck once I've got exposure of the muscles that way. <coughs> There's the incision. Um, you can see, whoops, the electrodes um, hang out of the mouth. Um, and uh, just some nice diagrams we had done. We use an endoscope in there as well. The endoscope uh, gets a view for us once we put the implant in and stimulate to make sure the airway is open nicely. This is where the electrode sits on the hypoglossal nerve that it's going into the um, genioglossus muscle. <coughs> Here's an intraoperative uh, video just showing you stimulating the nerve. So that's hypoglossal nerve, this is genioglossus muscle. Now there I'm stimulating a little branch of the nerve going to the hypoglossus. That electrode is in the hypoglossus muscle. I don't want to stimulate that because that's going to pull the tongue back. So that little branch there, I've got to make sure the electrode doesn't stimulate that. So I make a pocket between those two branches of the nerve. So here's the genioglossus on the right side, hypoglossal nerve. Once I've made the pocket to fit the electrode, I put a little adrenaline-soaked uh, cottonoid there uh, to keep the pocket nice and dry, ready for me to come back and put the electrode in after I've done the other side. So that's how we stimulate it. And that's how we know that we've got the electrode in the right position. All of this, by the way, um, I wanted to do my first implant at Hollywood um, in our first trial. Um, a guy came out from Germany who um, had uh, been involved in um, putting in an implant. Uh, they had put in about four of an earlier generation of this in Germany. It was only a single-sided implant. And uh, they had a very sort of a rough idea of how to put it in, which involved putting the electrode out over here somewhere. Um, and the operation technique was terrible. And, uh, and not only that, it was a single-sided implant they put in. So um, we came out and, and we sort of modelled our way through the first implant. And then over the course of maybe um, of, uh, doing seven implants in the first trial and then about another 20 odd since then, I've changed the technique of the implantation now. We've, we've, we've placed the electrode in a much better fashion than, than I was shown by the German <coughs> um, This is the device in place at the end. We suture it into position and then close the neck up. At the end, before you extubate the patient, you stimulate the implant. You can see the epiglottis moving forward, so you know it's working. And uh, we also look at the tongue and see the tongue protruding. Now, this is a patient who, um, uh, this is a lady who had very, very severe sleep apnea. This is her awake, uh, upright, um, with her implant in, and we're about to stimulate it. And you can see, She's got a very narrow airway behind her epiglottis, and you'll see in a minute when the implant kicks in, it'll, it'll really open. You see that? It pushes the tongue a little bit. So it's quite dramatic the effect on the uh, tongue muscle, the epiglottis, and high airway position. So um, I guess many of you are thinking, well, if you're not timing it with the breathing, how do you work out how to you know, make the, the, the thing go on and off? We have a few different parameters we can set. We have a stimulus train, so it has a duty cycle, sort of on, off, on, off. We can vary the uh, on periods and the off periods in length. Often we have it, say, three and a half seconds on, one and a half off, or two and two, depending on the person and their breathing rate. The amplitude of the, um, of the uh, intensity of the stimulus. And then in each little stimulus train, it's not like a one continuous uh, electrical um, current. It's lots of little micro pulses. And we can vary the um, frequency of those pulses and the whips of those pulses. So if you make those little micro pulses wider, you deliver more energy and you get more stimulation. So we play around with these different variables in the sleep lab whilst they're having a sleep study in natural sleep. And we can control the little micro processor by a Bluetooth connection and vary the settings and see what effect it has on their sleep. <coughs> and we look at these sorts of um, graphs. So just to show you a couple of things here. This is the, um, this dark black stuff, this is when the stimulator is on. That's an artifact from the stimulator. And the flow signal, the breathing signal, um, is down here. This is the breathing in and out, in and out. 
So you can see that the stimulus trains overlap most of the respiratory cycle. So it, the fact that it's not timed with inspiration doesn't seem to matter. We overlap most of the respiratory cycle, and that's um, borne out in the results, which have been very good. So uh, we completed our first study here in Australia. Um, as I said, the first implant ever of this device was done in um, Hollywood, and we had um, we had uh, a few centres over east. There was uh, one in Sydney, uh, one in Wollongong, one in Melbourne, and here in Perth. Um, and uh, we had three in France as well. Um, and um, we had uh, about 27 patients in the trial, 22 completed the trial, um, and uh, the results were published in the European Research Journal. <coughs> now, currently we're in our second trial, which is bigger, 44 patients, only in Australia, and one centre in New Zealand. Um, and we're studying some of these patients that we excluded from the first trial. They're those patients that have that concentric collapse. Uh, those patients, they do not put the other inspired device in either, and I reckon, um, I reckon they do. Many of them do well with the implant. I'll show you some videos of that. So we're studying them as well in this trial. Uh, here was our publication from the first study. Uh, um, we, you know, had a pretty uh, tightly uh, controlled protocol, um, and uh, our data was pretty good. It was equivalent to the inspired data. Um, our data from our new trial is already heaps better than this because we've got much better at implanting the device as we've gone along and we're better at titrating it. However, it showed a statistically significant effect in AHI reduction and also uh, this is oxygen desaturation events so you can see people were desaturating a lot less with the device uh, on. Um, we didn't have any bad adverse events at all. Um, but uh, we showed that it was safe, we improved the sleep apnea a lot, and their quality of life measures all improved. They felt better. It also reduced snoring a lot too. The really severe snorers, virtually all of them became soft snorers. Now, the new trial we're doing um, is in Australia and New Zealand, as I said, it's a bigger trial. Um, we have been interrupted a lot with COVID-19, unfortunately, otherwise we would have finished it by now. Um, <clears throat> but hopefully we'll finish it soon. So, this is a patient from the, uh, the trial. Now this guy um, was excluded from our first trial because he had this concentric collapse, as you can see here, uh, behind the palate. It's like a, a circumferential obstruction. So he was implanted and went back to work the next day, actually. Um, and here he is with his stimulator on, and you can see the effect the stimulator is having on his palate. Um, now again, these patients were excluded from our first trial and from the device in North America and Europe, but you can see that in some patients at least, it really hauls their palate open as well. We're not quite sure how to predict this, but it probably works through the, uh, the palate glossus muscle and tension on that pulls the palate forward. So it's probably an anatomical, anatomical peculiarity that these patients have. Um, but it's fantastic to see and he has brilliant control of his sleep apnea um, with the device. Uh, this is his screening step study. Uh, apnea hypopnex 33, so severe sleep apnea. Um, here he is at three months with his stimulator on, 1.6. That's normal. Mm -hmm. Up to five is normal. So fantastic improvement. Um, and probably the most important uh, is the oxygen desaturation events per hour. That means 19 times an hour, he desaturated at least 4%. The oxygen desaturation is the driver of all of the cardiovascular complications of sleep apnea and it completely eliminated his oxygen desaturation so it's really protecting his heart and, and uh, blood pressure and so on. Um, <coughs> this is uh, just pictures in his sleep study. This is his screening study. You can see all the apneas and hypopneas and his oxygen data here with all the desaturations. And if you look at it now, there's the odd hypopnea. No apneas really, and his oxygen trace is much, much, much better. Um, this is another patient from the trial, similar, similar story really. This is the uh, uh, without the stimulator on, and this is with the stimulator going. Um, once again, this guy had severe sleep apnea. Um, this is a drug-induced sleep endoscopy, 
So you see the terrible airway here uh, without the stimulator on. You can see what the stimulator is doing here. Uh, the other good thing that you see when you're doing these is without the stimulator on, they desaturate a lot. And the anesthetist starts to get a little bit concerned when their oxygen sats drop them down to 70 to 60%. And then with the stimulator on, their oxygen levels always stay up above 90 in a patient like this. So um, that's the, uh, the new approach to uh, treating obstructive sleep apnea in moderate to severe sleep apnea. So you cannot tolerate CPAP, cannot tolerate splints, and aren't good candidates for either uh, orthognathic surgery or soft tissue surgery. Uh, it's a minimally invasive procedure. It does take a bit of work on the bar for the patients to get titrated properly, but with very, very uh, minimal mobility and downtime, it's uh, got a lot of uh, things going for it. It'll get better and better, and also um, there's work in progress to stimulate other nerves to help stabilise the nerves of the airway as well. So uh, I think in the future, uh, quite a lot of patients will probably uh, uh, have this sort of treatment rather than. Uh, the for the rest of life. Thanks very much. Uh, so uh, both the Inspire device and the Spoxello device have pretty much finished their TGO uh, approval process. <coughs> the TGO set will be finished by the end of July. Here we are in August and they have finished it. Um, so it's imminent that it'll be through the TGA. The Medicare item uh, number for it has been approved. Um, so really, as soon as the TGA approval through the, I guess the company or both the companies that produce both the devices, will then start negotiating, I suppose, with insurance companies and so on, and then it'll be available. So it shouldn't be too long. Does anyone else have anything? Ask Richard. By the way, Richard is very thank If um, anyone feels that they want to refer a sleep apnea patient for um, or deviated septums and, and so on to uh, Richard, he, he, brings, he has a private practice at home. And, um, and as you can see, he's on the cutting edge of, um, of everything. So, Thanks for the presentation, it's very informative. Uh, we have, some, as you were saying, compliance issue with CPAP as well as with teaching and with discipline. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah. This seems like it will have a bit of compliance, but it's saying titrating is an issue. Mm. How long do you think that period of tritation is going to be versus what compliance issue is between the first two modalities that have mm -hmm. fairly varied results and how that would affect? Uh, yeah. potential yeah. usage in the industry. Yeah, so um, in these studies, we are following them for, uh, the, the trial period goes for six months, and we're doing some studies at um, two, three, four, and six months. And at the two, three, and four month studies, we change the settings. Now, um, that's within the uh, confines of a trial. In, once it's available on the market, that will be able to be condensed into probably maybe two sleep studies, I would say. Um, there's a lot of R&D going on with this device to, um, you know, in a lot of ways. Number one, um, they're uh, providing or developing a um, remote controller for the patient to automatically or themselves change settings. The Inspire device has that, it's like a volume button up and down. <clears throat> so patients can kind of titrate it a bit according to things like snoring, tiredness, how they feel, what their partner says. Uh, so they can kind of up in amplitude or the intensity if they like. Um, there are um, also, uh, we have a couple of uh, research things going on to automatically titrate it using um, a feedback uh, signal and some sort of artificial intelligence or, or really computer algorithm to to monitor things like airway vibration and increase stimulus intensity to diminish that. Um, but at the moment, I would say the titration could be completed on two sleep studies, and then and then they should be pretty set. So once it's set, I'm assuming mm -hmm. that I would think that that's more compliant than what potentially a CPAP or a MAS would be. Yeah. 
you're right. SIMPAP uh, has a whole lot of tension rights issues. Air uh, mask leaks and air, air escape, uh, turning over in bed and things pulling off, mask leaks again, the noise from the sleeping partner, the uh, uh, problems with taking it away on travel. Um, there's a whole lot of different reasons why SIMPAP compliance can be a problem. The splints can be rid of us and splints. Whilst compliance is much better for splints than it is for CPAP, TMJ problems, occlusion changes, uh, they're the two probably commonest uh, compliance problems we see. Um, so uh, I think from our compliance rates for this were really high. People, I mean, we only had a few people drop out of the trial. The main reason in that first trial was because uh, the French patients actually that got infections and things like that, which is why we didn't have the service in France in the second trial. Um, but, um, but yeah, compliance is much, much, much better. I'm assuming you like with the senses that you do put in. So, so sorry for interrupting, but I think right this minute we've got a couple of other guys talk, talking as, as well. So I'll give you two Richard afterwards. So, excuse me. Um, we've got James mm -hmm. from just before I do my speech, you've got a question. Mm -hmm. If you don't mind. Um, with the uh, nerve stimulation, are there any adverse effects on the actual stimulation, electrical stimulation of the nerve, the amplitude, and I know it's the uh, titration that the site, uh, like the, the signal is pretty much a block wave. Mm. Is there, in the pulse width modulation, is there an actual sine wave that's used to ramp up the, the amplitude yeah. on each signal, or is it really a binary on off activation of the nerve? We do both, we try both with the patients. So we can um, we do two types of ramping. So uh, we set a delay, first of all, when they go to bed, so they might have. 15 minutes late before it actually starts. And then we ramp it up to their therapeutic setting. And then within each stimulus train, uh, we have a, can put in a ramp within. So rather than being a sudden abrupt stimulation, if there's a ramp within. One of the concerns about hot loss nerve stimulation was that, um, I don't know if you've ever been up really late at night or watching TV and those weird shows you see after midnight. Um, you the one that sells stuff on TV. And you see those pictures of guys with an incredible six pack and uh, and and they say, Oh, you don't need to just sit up and exercise and run all that stuff six packs, you just strap this thing on, keep drinking your beer, eating your camel beer or whatever, and the muscle stimulation will give you six packs no problem. Obviously it doesn't work, but hypertrophy in the muscle by repeated stimulation is one of the concerns just uh, and uh, so so the theory was that if you keep stimulating the heart the nerve, um, the tongue muscle will high pressure and you'll get a big fat tongue and you'll overcome the effect. <laughs> so there's seven years, sorry, six year follow-up data on this fire device now. And the effect, the therapeutic effect is absolutely stable. It doesn't decay, so that's not a concern. Um, the reason we have the um, duty cycle is you, if you have a constant stimulation, of course you fatigue the, the nerve and the muscle. Um, so we haven't seen any uh, neuromuscular damage in any sort in seven years of data between the two devices now. Great. Good. That's pretty impressive. Um, James from Singular Health is, is going to give you a, a short presentation. I know that, that everyone's time is, is valuable. And thank you very much for coming to the lecture tonight. Um, he, he's demonstrating the virtual reality and, um, and they've got a machine outside if you want to have a look at it as, as well. So thanks, James. Thank you. But, um,
looked at a case in, a, in an MRI of uh, ovarian cancer. Um, you know, so you saw it in you know, a PET scan, did a follow-up MRI, and this, this tumour was quite thin. It wrapped itself around the ovary, and it was incredibly difficult going slice by slice in the, with the sagittal and, and coronal and axial views to actually pick up the shape, size, and location of that tumour and how it's going to macroscopically operate on the, on the tumour. So uh, he basically went to some software developers and said, turn it into 3D for me. And uh, a couple of months later, they were able to kind of do a very basic render, but huge graphics cards, um, you know, you had to have multiple computers kind of put together to, to view it. Um, a couple of years later, um, and being able to now do CT, PET, MRI scans. Uh, can't do OPGs yet, but we're working on it. Um, we're able to render uh, scans in situ, so on a device that's offline within about 60 to 90 seconds, and now walk through it in VR. So it's not just being able to visualize in 3D, you can put this headset on and literally walk inside the patient. So I'll provide you a bit of a, a demo once that's set up the virtual reality space. Um, but we, we work with, uh, you know, from neurosurgeons through to hip and, um, you know, hip and joint, um, or, or the orthopedic surgeons, um, and also now UWA Dental School, uh, and with Gunawanadine, uh, again, another good supporter of ours on the actual maxillofacial and, um, you know, mandibular uh, enlargements, etc. So, uh, start off with a nerve tract. Uh, from a <coughs> mandibular CV, CT scan. You'll actually see here in the bottom left, uh, this is the time to load a, a scan, so a chrome beam CT. So again, uh, the speed of conversion is something that's important to us. If you're going to show it to a patient and provide your patient with this 3D or VD, uh, VR walkthrough, you want to be able to render it very quickly for your, uh, your scan. So I can now grab this model, the tool panel, and strip that. To expose the mandible here. So we're able to change this threshold. And I can now walk into the patient. So I can go through the uh, mental frame and walk through. And now I'm going to walk up oh. the mandibular nerve tract. I'll bring back a little bit of soft tissue. Uh, tissue here. And uh, I'll show this, this uh, actual. Um, specific case to, to Alex when I was demoing the software to him and uh, the first thing he noticed and, and one thing that's really important for patients is this periodontitis here. So obviously when you're trying to get a patient to adhere to a uh, treatment plan you're telling them you know don't floss your teeth and your teeth will fall out. It's a bit hard to uh, convince them when all they've got is you know uh, the occasional bleeding gum. But sending them away for a, a short CBCT scan and bring it back to them, showing them, you know, your bone is literally eroding underneath the gum there, uh, is a good way of, of reinforcing the need to uh, come back and there we go. So we can do an intersection, we can push in and, and have a look at the, the uh, roots from any angle. And again, I'll show you how we can, so on the cone beam CT scan here, the mandibular nerve tract is ex extremely easy to um, again, I can actually just put my head inside of it and walk down that nerve tract <laughs> and then out the, uh, the frame at the front uh, and you can see the uh, sinus cavity above and the intersection that you have with the teeth. So again, I'll, I'll intersect and you can push down and, and see the, the roots and, and how they are actually structured uh, from above and look for any calcification, etc. Uh, now you can come out of this, and uh, we've loaded in lightsabers. 
uh, drawing tools, so a full um, drawing palette. Um, you can circle areas of interest. You can draw your bone line there. Show the uh, you know, periodontitis there. And again, you can see it from 3D. So you can come in from this angle and you can really see that erosion in there. And um, showing this to patients, obviously patients, uh, you know, you send them home and you tell them to come back for the follow-up. And it's very difficult to bring a patient back into uh, to the clinic sometimes. So, uh, you know, when I show you the, the maxillofacial case in just a second, you'll see that you can show them wisdom teeth that aren't yet impacting, or periodontitis where their tooth isn't yet loose, uh, and then uh, provide them this scan. We've during coronavirus when we weren't able to get into dental clinics. Uh, in hospitals, we worked on uh, making this rendering that works now on a laptop work on your mobile phone. So you can give a patient, you can actually provide a patient with their chrome beam CT scan rendered in 3D that they can go home and turn it around and view it in a 3D render rather than seeing it from uh, the, uh, you know, just in the axial or sagittal or coronal view. Take a little bit longer to, to load in. It's 539 uh, slices uh, taken with a 3ml cup. Um, and yeah, uh, again, you'll see it loading down the bottom. So, um, where we really see this being used, and uh, again, um, we're down at UWA Dental School, we've got a system down there, and they're using the skull orthodontic uh, surgery. So, um, typically they use materialized and anamage, uh, but we're down there kind of letting them review the cases themselves um, in VR and kind of walking through the mouth and on the inside and you can even, you'll be able to see in a sec, just walk up the airway um, from the inside out. So again, seeing is bleeding. The actual VR screen is in colour. Uh, the VR at the moment is in black and white, but we uh, have been adding colour. Um, we've got an education product. Um, I haven't shown you that one yet, Alex. But we've got an education product uh, for high school through fourth year med students, um, which allows students to actually view cases and pathologies in 3D and VR, rather than just seeing it in a 2D textbook. <coughs> so we've got a case here. Um, we can now go for a little walk up the uh, esophagus. So we're inside, walking up the, uh, the airway, and we can have a look around. Maybe uh, Dr. Wilson could uh, narrate where I am. <laughs> uh, yeah, and now moving up, we're um, there. We go. Yeah, perfect. Collaborative walkthrough. Yeah. So we're in the. Uh, Sinal cavity here, and finally, if I walk out the front and turn around, there's the face right behind me. So, fully immersive, I mean, you're actually able to walk around the, the case uh, and view it from, from any angle. So, again, sinal cavity above the forehead, uh, and again, we can now go through, strip that sinus soft tissue, and expose the bony windows. So, we can go in now. Prior to this presentation, I've segmented uh, the uh, left and right ramus and also the uh, mandibular body at the front. And this is really just a proof of concept of some of the things that we're working with with UWA Dental School. So being able to extract that front mandibular body. And while I'm in VR, in all six degrees of freedom, place that back in and look at the uh, placement not just uh, you know, advancing it forward, but rotating it. I'm no dentist, so uh, whether it's good up their bite there. <laughs> but we can cut in and we can look at you know, where there's a crossover and where there's an interaction between the, uh, the top teeth and the bottom teeth. Um, rotating that scan. Uh, we can obviously hide those uh, implants. 
and go inside the mouth. So you're looking at the patient from the inside out. You're able to uh, see the wisdom tooth down there and the wisdom tooth up the top. And as I slice in here, we can see the wisdom tooth, not just in terms of the angle it's going to impact from side on, but which way it's uh, progressing, you know, any angle, so I can just rotate this around. So, um, thank you again, Alex, for the uh, opportunity to demo. Um, I invite any of you to uh, come on outside and uh, immerse yourself into the world of virtual reality. Thank you. Surgeons will actually have their head scopes, have, will have their heads up display like the fighter pilots and be able to look at what they're doing in VR at the same time as they're, they're doing their surgery. But they won't seem to be seen two state of the art things in the art drive by Frank, which is always for his time now. And um, so thank you. <laughs> Thank you.